كده تمام بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وبه نستعين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين سيد الخلق أجمعين وصحبه وسلم uh, We are going to continue our press uh, imaging series approach to mammography number three today based on breast anatomy Uh, the objectives of this lecture is recognition of normal breast anatomic structures, to be familiar with the normal anatomy as visualized on mammography, so that findings can also be correlated with other breast imaging modalities, and understanding normal breast anatomy and its lymphatic that can help us in evaluation the, of disease of cancer disease extent more accurately. Okay, uh, starting by this uh, mammographic image and illustrations of normal uh, anatomy of adult female, what we can see here, fibroglandular tissue opaque cresting on the pectoralis major and deep here is Pectoral is minor going out, nipple and skin. Here is the retromammary fat and the premammary fat, uh, deep and superficial fascia. Huh. Would you comment on this image? First of all, is it normal or abnormal? Dr. Salah, for you, is it an abnormal mammogram or a normal mammogram? Do you hear me? Yes, I hear you. Okay. I... For you, is it normal or abnormal? It's abnormal. Excellent. Abnormal. In which term it is abnormal? What is abnormality? Abnormality. Uh -huh. it, it seems more fibrotic or more increased. More increased what, yes? Your network is really... <laughs> difficult interrupted yeah we could not recognize what you are saying yeah, yes it is then mm -hmm. increase breast uh-huh you are right increase breast what fibrotic tissue fibrotic, fibrotic tissue it's okay what is the terminology Yani, the anatomic terms of this fibrotic tissue. When you are saying fibrotic tissue, you are talking about normal or abnormal structure. Abnormal, abnormal. Okay, so you mean this breast is fibrotic. There are fibrosis, there is fibrosis in this uh, breast. Yes. Okay, so no problem. We are going to understand uh, in more details. Sarah, any of Sarah's or Suhair? Yes. Tell me, tell me what is wrong about this image. In uh, inadequate view, first. Uh huh. Inadequate CC. The upper uh -huh. part not involved. Uh huh. Okay, uh, ignore, try to ignore the, the quality of the image at this, in this lecture. Just tell me to go quickly, tell me what is, which, which, what is, what is abnormal. Diffuse fibroglandular occupying the whole breast. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thick what else? Skin. 
Skinny thickened. Excellent. Yeah. Skinny thickened. What else? What else? What is abnormal? What else is abnormal? Skin thickening. Regular mass. Lesion. It should be either diffuse or we'll talk later. But this is at least there is global skin thickening. What what else is abnormal? We're talking about certain we're not, yani, structures. These structures become abnormal. Normal structure become because it is edematous breast. Excellent. Why it is edematous? How do you explain this breast is edematous? You mentioned global skin thickening. When the second thing is how do you know? How do you know that this breast is edematous? Excellent. Excellent. Yes. Thick Cooper ligaments. It's okay. Excellent. Well done. The Cooper ligaments are thickened and there is decrease, increase uh, obesification. This it needs to, co to correlate with the other breast or to compare it with the other press. But at least now there is a skin thickening and thickening of the cover ligament. I don't know why it's stuck. What happened? Why is this stuck? Sarah, are you there? I am Mojuda. Stop. You cannot go on next slide? I cannot go anywhere. <laughs> See, I'm trying. Yes. <laughs> now it's going, Alhamdulillah. Okay. So, Dr. Salah, here you have two press which which one is normal and which one is abnormal? Start on the on the right is normal and on the left, which we seen previously is abnormal. Yes, now you can compare. You can see the normal. Huh? Mm. What you call it before fibrotic lines. Mm. These opaque thin it is thin opaque lines now here you can see it as roughly thickened and distorted thick and distorted and giving more opacity for the breast and you can compare the skin with this which is becoming very thick so we need to know what are the building blocks of the breast what doesn't represent these lines, these opaque lines? What, what about these opaque lines? What does it represent? Cooper's ligaments. Cooper's ligaments or fibrous strands. The Cooper ligaments or fibrous stroma or fibrous strands. Yes, you are right. And these, these again, there are linear structure structures seen here. Other than this structure we have seen before, what does it represent? This just behind the nipple. Mama redux. Excellent, mama redux. And what about these? These vessels. Huh? Represents blood vessels. Vessels. So linear density, linear water density corresponding to either fibrous strands or cover ligaments or stroma, vessels or ducts. These are the normal structures presenting as linear density, linear soft tissue densities. What about these dots? 
Here, seen in part of mammography, zoom view of mammography. And here we can see it in which there is what in the ductal system? There is contrast in the ductal system representing what? Ductography. Ductography. So what about these are the same as these dots? What does it represent, these small dots? As and, part of normal breast structures. Mm -hmm. and, and on dots? Representing what? Normal okay. structures. Normal structure, because we are talking about the building blocks of the mammography. And on dots? What? And, and on, on dots? dots? No, no, yes. not that. Not, not that, not that. A little bit more, uh, yani larger than the ducks. We call it what? There is flush of contrast into to what? Any of you? Yes. Hmm? Glands? Gland. Which, which part of the glands? We call it what? What do you call this part? Mm -hmm. A sinai. Okay, a sinai or larger than a sinai. Ductules. Ductules. Lobule. Lobule, so terminal duct, lobular unit, or a lobule. Okay? A lobule. Okay. A lobule, we'll see how from which yani, the composition of the lobule are multiple asina. Right. Again, what about this part in the building block? This homogeneous opaque structure. Is it normal or abnormal? Yes, we want to be familiar. You did not hear me? Uh, you are talking with me? Uh. Someone someone uh, wrote here uh, about the voice. Did you hear me well? No, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Okay. So here, I can't hear from the community. Okay. Shall we continue? What about this opaque structure? What does it represent? Mm -hmm. Glandular tissue? Yes, only glandular or we call it? Fibroglandular. Fibroglandular. This, this represents a fibroglandular. I don't know. I don't know why. It become... It's stuck again. It is stuck again. What happened? Okay, okay. It went. Okay. Homogeneous. Homogeneous structure. Guna. Uh, corresponding to fibroglandular, fibrous tissue or fibroglandular tissue. Okay, so what about this area represent? We talk here about the whitish area, but look for the arrow here corresponding to which part? The retromammary part. Corresponding to area of lucency or black area on the mammography. Not only retromammary, even something yeah, within, yeah. within the fibroblast. The interspersed the fat area. and the subcutaneous fat and the interspersed yes. fat within the yes. fibroglandular yes. and the retromammary. Yes, so this represents the fat or the adipose tissue within the breast, which could be seen in the pre-mammary region, retromammary, or interspersed within the fibroglandular tissue. Okay, so when you read mammography, when looking at mammography, you have to put in your mind 
okay? The illustration of the breast, normal anatomy of the breast. So you can imagine everything in the mammography, what does it represent? And what, what is this? What is this? What is this opaque structure here? What does it represent? Pectoralis uh, muscle, pectoralis major muscle. This is the pectoralis major muscles because the breast is resting into the pectoralis major muscles. If you go back to embryology of the breast, you know that the breast is modified the skin gland. It developed from the mammary ridge or the ectodermal ridge, which is a ventral band or ventral streak from the axilla to the groin, as we said previously. And as you remember, we said immediately when that developed, uh, it gets resolved. And it, with exception of a small middle area over the chest wall, representing the mammary bud, okay? If yani, any part of this line, any part through this line could not completely resolve, it might result in accessory press or accessory nipple. But this is most common where in the axilla, as we mentioned before. And when we look at mammography, we should not say this is an axillary pressed full stop. We have to make sure this axillary press is really normal pressed tissue. Here it is clear. It is heterogeneous like this one. Again here, okay? But we have to look very closely to make sure there is no pathology within this part. And when it is a small, especially, you see, like in this area, the ectopic breast is a small. We don't know, is it a pathology or it is a real breast? So we have to put, to do what? A spot compression, magnification view to make sure this is just a normal fibroglandular accessory breast not representing any pathology. In this elderly woman here, she has an ectopic breast, but also we are not sure she has a dense regular breast and she has ectopic breast. But when looking closely, it's not spread away, but it become, it appear like what? It is an speculated okay. mass, no. which is seen here, seen on ultrasound, and proven to be infiltrating ductal carcinoma. And also we said that the accessory breast, it can be a ectopic breast separate from the main breast or extension of the main breast through the foramen of what? Langer uh, along the anterior pectoral fascia into the axilla representing the tail of his pens. And we have to make sure is it what we have seen here? Is it a, a, a cancer in the tail of his pens or in the axilla versus metastatic lymph node? Because the management is different. And when we go back to the regenesis of the breast, okay, we said it developed under genetic and hormonal influences from skin precursor, resulting in breast bud. Very subtle, that breast bud, okay, does not affect by hormone. It's hormonal independent, but it starts to penetrate into the epidermis or into the mesenchyme. And it continue lengthening, okay? And sending what? Multiple rods into deep into the mesenchyme or into the dermis forming complex network 
of radiating what future pressed but at its or uh, orifice here there is a epithelial bit which transform into nipple areolar complex and this what we call it the rudimentary mammary but mammary gland the rudimentary mammary gland which is hormonal dependent okay affecting by the placental hormone all these are in antenatal life okay this affecting by uh, by the uh, placental hormone in the proliferation and development of these ductal or glandular part okay from the epidermis as well as the underlying mesenchyme, develop the stroma, including the vessels, as well as the fat and connective tissues. Is it clear? Is it clear? So the breast form from ectoderm, representing the glands, ducts and alveoli, as well as the underlying epidermis or mesoderm forming the stroma uh, containing fat, connective tissue, and vessels. So when we go to the key anatomic structures in the breast include the glandular part, which represent lactiferous sinus, lactiferous duct, and breast lobules, which are about 10 to 100 lobules bear uh, uh, parenchyma or per gland. This is a glandular tissue. This is where the main pathology arises. These are embedded into the stroma, as we have seen in the embryology, which form from Cooper ligaments, fascia, and fat stroma, which represent the main bulk. The glandular and stroma together forming the breast parenchyma. Both the breast parenchyma, including the glandular as well as the stromal part, are influenced by female hormones. And any distortion, destruction, abnormal size, number, or texture of this structure of the parenchyma will result in breast pathology. Clear? Okay, we said the rudimentary breast, but okay, it will stay like that. The baby bears with this rudimentary breast and it will stay as rudimentary until the puberty. There is some theory said that after two years with uh, hypothalamic pituitary axis surge and something like that, that the gland start to gradually develop slowly. There is one theory like that. And the other, they said, no, it, it become dormant until puberty. So from the pairs till puberty, the breast is the same for boys and girls, but it will affect the lobular alveolar growth or development will be affected by hormone. It will be influenced by hormone. So any change or imbalance in hormone, okay, can result in premature thylark at any age. Okay, let us go for this illustration we discussed last time. We said until puberty, it is rudimentary ductal system. So at the end of the of terminal ducts, rudimentary ducts, they said there is something, there, uh, there are cells called stem cells. These are responsible for proliferation of the ductal system and development of uh, lobule or terminal duct lobular uh, units. So for, by stimulation of or influence of female hormones along with growth hormones start the ductal system from simple rudimentary ductal system to complex branching morphogenesis. Okay, and then start to develop these terminal duct 
lobular units. And the process under female hormones stimulation, it progress and proceed throughout adult life. And this is very important from the beginning of uh, puberty, okay, till complete development of the breast, these cells are immature and will be affected by any carcinogenic uh, effect like radiation. That is why any female exposed at this period, okay, up to 30 years, this is mainly the period of development of the breast. The breast become immature. At any period of this, if she exposed a lot of for radiations, the breast might uh, be affected and develop uh, breast cancer. That is why we should not expose young ladies for mammography before the age of 30. This is when 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 uh, issue. The other things, this also, uh, they, uh, these cells or the terminal duct lobular unit, as we mentioned before, it progress uh, uh, during and it develop during, uh, more during pregnancy. So during pregnancy, functional differentiation of the glandular parenchyma, it accelerate and accelerated more during lactation because the gland are the factory of milk, okay? So if the lady married early and she get first full term pregnancy by age of 18, you know that she have much lower risk of breast cancer than the lady develop her first baby at the, after the age of 30 because she accelerate the development or maturations of her breast earlier. Complete maturations, it will occur earlier. Okay. And in male, what will happen in male? As you know, the testosterone served during puberty, it will cause involution of these ducts. That is why their breasts usually compose, compose only of fat with absence of fibroglandular parenchyma. However, in many of boys during the puberty, they have what is called uh, physiological gynecomastia. Why? Because fluctuation in hormonal environment result in some implants and estrogen dominate the testosterone result in a transient gynecomastia and usually resolve after two years. And for the female, interactions of the glandular and stromal tissue, it continue throughout life. And as you know, by withdrawal of hormones, then withdrawal of hormone of lactation ferris, then some of the uh, developed or proliferate terminal duct lobular unit, it involutes. And that is why the breast getting fat is smaller. But the more involutions occur in postmenopausal due to withdrawal of female or ovarian hormones, and the breast become more fatty as we discussed before. And we discussed what are the opaque structures, what are linear structures, and how fibroglandular appear as white, why the, the fibrous strom or puber ligament appear as linear, the vessels appear as linear, and all these together, the stroma representing what and the glandular, how does it appear on mammography, and the combination and the percentage of the fibroglandular tissue in relation to the fatty component of the breast, it, it, it reflects the density of the breast, okay? Whenever we have more fibroglandular parenchyma, that means the breast is more white, is more dense, okay? When the breast gets involuted, going 
less resolution of the fibroglandular parenchyma and predominating the fat, so it become clear. And that is why the sensitivity here, because the cancer is white and fibroglandular parenchyma is white, difficult, there is no contrast and difficult to be appreciated. And since 19, 53 or 1967, there are pioneers that describe that not only obscure the, 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 the underlying cancer, but also uh, radio, radiographically dense breast has increased risk of breast cancer since that time. Okay. If we look here for the, even the breast size is affected by these physiological changes. And as you know, by growing the breast from childhood to uh, puberty to adulthood, when it grows, the size is getting larger and the breast is getting fair, especially during pregnancy and lactation can reach the maximum. But after withdrawal of hormone during uh, menopause again the breast start to get smaller the breast it will get, uh, become smaller it become fat and due to to withdrawal or horm of these hormones it's also getting dehydrated and due to dehydration decrease elasticity and associated with loss of volume and shrinkage of the breast okay so it becomes smaller and become sagging also. Okay. Let us go again to uh, anatomy of the breast. I prefer that to go from microscopic back to gross anatomy because this is more a little bit more details. The microscopic anatomy of the breast is a detailed anatomy and it needs concentration. That is why I prefer to start when we are fresh, still fresh. We can understand it better than the, at the end of the, the lecture. So when you look to this illustration, you understand that the breast is composed of multiple segments or multiple lobes. It is usually more than 20 lobes. Each lobe has a main lactiferous duct open at or on the nipple. Okay. And are arranged radially okay, toward the nipple. And each lobe, it, it is like an independent glandular entity. It contains of multiple lobules between 20 to 40 lobules. And separated by interlobular uh, septa or fibrous septations. And these lobules are linked by a network uh, or thin ducts or ductules. Again, if you look here for these illustrations from the nipple, the ducts going like this, okay? The terminal ducts there end into lobules and the terminal ducts along with lobules, they call it the terminal duct lobular unit. If we look here, this is like a three, okay? This is, we can consider it when a lobule, or this we can consider it when a lobe, I mean, not a lobule, a lobe. This is a lactiferous duct, and these representing uh, alveoli, okay? Uh, the main duct, as we said, are prize or branching into segmental and subsegmental until it ends into terminal duct lobular unit. Okay. It looks like a tree. The main duct, okay, going into segmental and subsegmental to the terminal portions. And until here, this is a lobule along with extralobular duct representing the terminal duct lobular unit. This is a ductal anatomy. 
And this is the area where almost all pathology up to 98% occurs in the terminal duct lobular unit, including proliferative changes of fibroadenomas as well as lobular and ductal carcinoma. While in the main duct, we can see mainly 15% of the disease, ductectasia and benign and malignant papillary tumor. Clear? Okay. Here, this is simplified anatomy of female breast. We can see the same. Look here, this is a ductal system. The main duct branches into segmental and subsegmental tulopule. So look here, as the terminal duct lobular unit, you can see sclerosing adenosis, fibroadenoma, fibrocystic cyst. When you go to the main duct, you can see here only what? A babyloma. And this is normal and abnormal. Uh, simplified anatomy illustrations for the this is a normal class of the of the uh, of breast tissue and this is abnormal look here these are the major ducts when you go to the glandular portion or terminal duct lobular unit you can see multiple cysts representing and fibrous tissue representing fibrocystic process or fibrocystic conditions so these are ductogram and this is a mammogram, fulfill digital mammography. What you have seen here, this is what benign papilloma where it is within a major duct. Here, this ductectasia and on mammography also you have a ductectasia. Can you see it here very close to the nipple? at the level of the major duct. So at the level of the major duct, the main disease, what we can see is ductectasia and papillary uh, disease. While the remaining of most of breast conditions expected to be seen at the level of terminal duct lobular unit. So this terminal duct lobular unit is very important. Why? Because it is a basic functional and histological unit of the breast. And most of the cancers arise at these levels. If we will start, okay, if we consider where the milk is produced, this is the proximal portion. So the lobule, we will consider it as a proximal structure going to the periphery to the nipple. Or if we consider the nipple is the uh, starting point, going major duct to the periphery or deep into the breast. This is a major duct or lactiferous duct divided into segmental and subsegmental going to the terminal duct, lobular unit. And what we can see here, not always the terminal duct lobular unit necessarily to be seen deep, okay, or at the periphery of the breast. We can see some terminal duct lobular unit very close to the major ductal system here. That is why you can see some pathology very close to the nipple. Okay, so if we'll go further to understand what is terminal duct lobular unit. When you look here, this is the major duct. And as we have seen in the previous illustrations, the major duct start to divide segmental, subsegmental ductal system until to reach to a terminal duct, okay? This is a terminal duct outside the lobule, we call it extra lobular terminal duct. And the same duct, extralobular terminal duct extending inside the lobule and we call it intralobular terminal duct. So the terminal duct or the end of the ductal system, okay, 
divide it into portion outside the lobule, we call it extralobular, and inside the lobule, we call it intralobular. And after coming intralobular, then start to, it become blind forming, a blind ended cluster of ductules, okay? Like finger-like gloves. This is the same duct start to form these alveoli or ductules or acini, okay? This is the glandular acini or the security, secretory, sorry, secretory unit. This is where the milk uh, is produced, okay? This is the olfactory uh, of the milk. The factory, sorry, the factory of the milk. This is the factory of the milk, okay? And this is alveoli or acini, as we mentioned, is a finger-like gloves or these alveoli, okay? It is the end of the ductal system. It become like that. And inside the ducts, inside of these is intralobular terminal duct. And these inside here, there is connective tissue stroma. There is a specialized connective tissue stroma connecting these ductules. These ductules are connected by a special type of stroma. So what is a lobule? What is a lobule? The lobule is composed of intralobular terminal duct, as we mentioned here. These ductules or acini, okay? These ductules or acini, okay? Interconnecting with specialized loose tissue. The specialized loose tissue connecting these ductules or acini, as well as the intralobular uh, loose tissue, stroma, intralobular duct, together the structure forming what is called the lobule. And the parenchyma contain from 10 to 100 lobules. You got it. Is it clear? Uh, is it clear? Okay. So the end branch of the ducts, the end branch of the ducts, this part, the extralobular terminal duct, along with the lobule, collectively together, they call it the terminal duct lobular unit. So what is the terminal duct lobular unit? It's form of the lobule and extralobular terminal duct. When we say the pathology, arise in a terminal duct lobular unit, we don't mean that it arises only inside the lobule. It can be arise into the lobule, including the duct intraductal lobular, or in intralobular, I mean intralobular duct, or extralobular duct. So there is ductal element within the terminal duct lobular unit. This is very, very important. Because when we talk later about the disease process or from where the origin of the cancer, when we said lobular, we don't mean, when we said ductal, not necessarily to be ductal from the main duct here. From here, even it is ductal. From here, even it is ductal. But in the remain of the lobule, then we are talking about lobular. You got it? Is it clear? Do you have a question here or is it clear? Shall we go for the next? It's okay. So when we look the same, you see, if you look for the ducts and the cellular component of the ducts is seen in continuation with lobular cells. The lobular cell and ductal cells are more or less the same and seen in continuation and both of which are influenced by female hormones. 
This portion is clear. No one answer. It's okay. No problem. If it is clear, your boss. Clear. Good. Again, microscopic anatomy of terminal duct lobular unit. This is the duct, segmental duct. This is a terminal duct, but the portion of terminal duct outside of a lobule. We call it what? What do we call the, the portion of the duct, terminal duct outside the lobule? Extralobular terminal. Extralobular, terminal duct. excellent. Extralobular terminal duct. Look for the, okay. Extralobular terminal duct. When we go, this is the lobule. When we go inside the lobule, we have intralobular terminal, intralobular terminal duct. And we have multiple ductules or athena. This is the gray representing what? The intralobular stromal fibrous tissue. It is a loose, a special type of loose fibrous connective tissue. It is loose connective tissue. It is the same stroma as very ductile stroma. It is also special connective tissue stroma. It is different from the remain of interlobular stroma that filling the whole breast, supporting the breast. Different from the Cooper ligaments. These are the Cooper ligaments and interlobular are compact stromal fibrous tissue. If you remember the ultrasound lecture, even on ultrasound lecture, on ultrasound, their appearance or echogenicity is different. We mentioned it before, and we are going to mention again in ultrasound pictures. Okay? So just remember the connective tissue or the stromal tissue supporting the lobule inside the lobule and in periductal area is special loose interlobular or periductal stroma, different from the compact stroma connecting the lobule together or connecting the ductal or supporting the breast. Now, I think this is a better, more clear. So these illustrations representing again the duct and these multiple terminal duct lobular unit, we can see it here in a ductogram. This one, it looks normal because the terminal duct lobular unit, it should be not more than two millimeter. And we can see it here. This is a blush of contrast uh, in the terminal duct lobular unit. But what is the difference between this and this? There are variable size, larger terminal duct lobular unit representing what? Cyst. Fibrocystic. Terminal duct here, this is one cyst and this is multilobulated cyst, okay? representing fibrocystic disease. And if we look here, for this illustration, this is a lactiferous duct, this is extra lobular terminal duct, and this is a lobule. When we look here for the lobule, we can see a senile, okay? And both extra lobular and this lobule together form the terminal duct, Lobular unit, and what we have seen here, this what representing this is the red branching is intralobular, <laughs> intralobular, <laughs> yes, intralobular terminal. <laughs> so, if we try to apply it here, what is yes. going? What is going on? There are variation in size. And if you look for this, this is more or less the same, but it is definitely abnormal. There is enlargement of the asini in a terminal duct lobular unit, filling or connected with the ductal system and filled with contrast 
in a case of fibrocystic disease. And this is what we call it cluster microcyst. You are familiar with it on ultrasound, but you are not familiar with it on ductography. You got it? This is yes. a cluster. This is a cluster microcyst. Microcyst. Argument of a sinai in a terminal duct lobular unit. Here we can compare it with this normal size. Okay. Yani flush into uh, a sinai. Okay. Or into terminal duct or into lobules. This is a normal. This is a normal one. There is flush into normal because the width of which is uh, below uh, two millimeter. Again, if we compare this ductography, okay, of fibrocystic, the caliber here, these are large cysts, are more than two millimeter. You compare with the three dimensional histology image here, it shows this, this normal terminal duct lobular unit because the size of which is, is below less, two millimeter as an eye less than two but look for this this is as a whole look how this is cystic dilatation of a sinai mm -hmm. sinai demonstrates cystic dilatation in the fibrocystic and when we look even okay when we look within these asini look for these dots in the histology these are represent apocrine metaplasia, which is just uh, cell increased cellularity, part of fibrocystic chains. Okay, so as we mentioned before, 85% of pathology benign or malignant breast diseases or conditions arise in to the terminal duct lobular unit. Whatever fibroadenoma, uh, proliferative changes, apocrine, metaplasia, as we have seen, adenosis, epithelioses, all arising. But definitely for the patients and for us, okay, always concerning about ductal carcinoma, infiltrating or in situ, and infiltrating lobular. <coughs> And the theory behind why cancer arises in the terminal duct lobular unit, they said, and as we describe in embryology, uh, we said that there are stem cells at the end of primitive terminal, primitive at the end of primitive ducts, okay, responsible for the growing of the ductal system and formation of alveoli and terminal duct lobular unit. And due, because these stem cells are influenced by hormone and are undifferentiated cells, are likely to develop malignant transformation. Because the proliferation here is high, okay, and due to rapid proliferation, there, are, there is chance for DNA mutations and uh, DNA replications and then malignant transformations. Okay. Microscopic anatomy, we have to know what is, we mentioned before, the same cells in the ductal system from the ductal system extending into the lobule. lobule. What are the component of these epithelial uh, cells? What are the epithelial cells of the ducts or the uh, lobule? The ductal lobular system composed of two, Simple main, two main cells. The inner, which is the luminal epithelial cuboidal cells, okay, which is, uh, which is secreting the milk. And the outer one, the basal myoepithelial, okay? And this is important, and as well as the basement membrane surrounding from outside these two cells. Okay, 
we'll see why this is important, the basement membrane and the basal cells, because it will differentiate between healthy DCI, healthy cells, DCIS, and invasive cancer. Here we can see this is the luminal, okay? The natural luminal cells in these illustrations. And the red one is myoepithelial cells. Here it is intact, as well as the outer basement membrane. Here there is proliferation, okay, of cells uh, into the lumen of the ducts. But however, look for the red myoepithelial cells as well as basement membrane are so intact. So we are dealing with ductal carcinoma in situ. It's still confined to the duct. But when there is breach in the outer layer, the basal layer and the basement membrane and the cells coming out into the adjacent tissue, then we call it invasive ductal carcinoma or invasive cancer. Okay, and here this is a, a histological image demonstrate. Mm -hmm. Who is talking? Tadena Alena Arwa. Bas Ashan for more understanding. يعني ما حندخل في تفاصيل أكثر لكن بس عشان يعني نرسخ المعلومة إنه here we have two layers خلاص the inner layer these are the luminal cells and the outer layer this is the myoepithelial cells and this the outer pink line is the basement membrane so all are intact we are not and the cells it seemed to be healthy. We are not going to talk about the nucleus and more details. It is not our area. Just we brought this image to understand yani, that illustration we have seen. And if you look for this uh, cells, definitely is abnormal, not like this one, healthy one. And they mentioned that this is a DCIS and I cannot talk more about this. But for sure, we can see the basement membrane here from outside. At least the findings, what we have seen is confined, is not going, extending into the adjacent uh, uh, tissue. Okay, as you know, the breast is like a tree. Okay, a network of ducts and lobule extending like this into the breast. So we have ducts, lobules, uh, having two types, two layers of cell, two different cells in, embedded into stroma. So we have variations of cells within the breast. And definitely the tumor, breast tumor, cell origin, it will be different. This result in heterogeneity of the breast diseases or breast cancer disease. Okay? And it, Apart from just saying the proliferation of epithelial cell confined to the cells with intact myobicelial layer, or there is a breach in the myobicelial layer, layer and extending into the adjacent tissue, there are other factors also they are considering in their pathology or report, including the grading, nuclear grade, the tumor site, the steroid receptors, the HER2 status, and other factors like CHI-67 and so forth. All these are prognostic factors and they are considering uh, and they are important for the uh, selections of treatment. And according to understanding of this anatomy, the new classification of breast cancer depends on cell origins they said that there is the adenocarcinoma uh, arising from the terminal duct lobular unit or from lobule, from the SNI of terminal duct lobular unit. They call it acinar adenocarcinoma of the breast. A, A, B, S, S for, for, uh, 
class for plural. Uh, a, B, B, uh, A, B, B, S. This is the acinar adenocarcinoma of the breast. And this arises from the acini, from the acini of terminal ductal unit. Why we said the acini? Because there is intralopular terminal duct. So if it is arising from the duct, if it is intra or extra, then we call it differently. We call it uh, ductal. Regarding the acinar adenocarcinoma, if it is in situ, we should not call it DCIS. We are calling CIS or lobular neoplasia or lobular carcinoma in situ. When now they are not considered as a precursor for cancer, they are not considered as cancer, the lobular in situ, but they consider it as moderate risk for breast cancer. And the ABBS has better prognosis. And they said that it is unifocal in more than 40% of cases. While the other type of cancer, according to the origins, is ductal adenocarcinoma of the breast. That cancer arises from the epithelia of the ducts and in situ, as we described before, and usually presenting as casting, linear or branching calcification, we call it DCIS or ductal carcinoma in situ, unlike CIS. And it depends from which cell it arises. And as we mentioned, if all components involves, including the basal, uh, the basement membrane, then definitely it will not be a DCIS. And it has worse prognosis, unlike ABB, AABs, it, it, the prognosis is worse, especially if it is invasive carcinoma, and so often involves the whole lobe, what is called uh, sick lobe syndrome. Here, this illustration can demonstrate, this is the lobule, intralopular ducts and extralopular ducts, the same is here. This is representation for calcification. This is the linear, linear distribution and linear morphology of the calcification. This is casting the ducts and usually represent the CIS, intraductal calcifications. Usually you are taking as a series. But when the calcification is seen within the acini, not within the duct of the, of the lobule, within the acini of the lobule, it is either milk of calcium uh, or rounded and most of the time sharp with little exceptions, okay? It's most of the time benign type of calcification. However, few uh, cancer can present like this. When we look here, we might say, yes, this it looks round type of calcifications. So probably this is a or lobular cans, uh, calcification, but we have to make sure we have to do a spot magnification view. Okay, look for the cancer now, for the calcification I mean now, it is not like what we have seen here. Mo it is glymorphic, but most most of which is linear. So we call it the words. We'll take the words. We'll go by linear branching calcifications. Okay. This is a case of a DCIS, ductal carcinoma in C. Okay. Shall we go to the next? Yes, yellows. Okay. So lobular distribution of the ductal system. As we mentioned before, this system like a tree. If you look for from here, for one ductal system, okay, from the nipple going into the breast, like this, the stem of the tree, like the main duct, and these branches of the tree representing 
the branching of the ductal system. Each duct divide into, as we mentioned, divide into segmental, subsegmental, until it reach ultimately the terminal duct, lobular units. So the major ducts, okay, it course away from the nipple in a radial pattern. It looks like what? It is similar to what? Mm -hmm. It's similar in this arborization like the trachea and bronchi. Mm -hmm. The trachea, the main duct like the trachea then go, or the main uh, bronchus, then going into segmental, subsegmental, like that until reaching the alveoli, the pulmonary alveoli, in the same way, okay, or more or less the same manner, like the bronchial tree. However, what is the difference between the breast and the lung? What we have seen here, we can see in this illustration as if there is this stromal lining, you see, very beautiful, divided the lobes into segments, okay? Yani, make it as if there is boundaries, but in the real, there is no boundaries, not like in the lungs. The lung, you know that between the lobes, there are boundaries between the lobes, okay? But in the breast, this illustration is not a true anatomic lines, denoting the segments. This is not a true. If we look here, this is one duct, another third like that. Look for the arborizations and the branches. Because there is no real boundaries, this ductal system coming, okay, to the level of that ductal system and so forth. So the ducts are tortuous, are complex. It's not just as simple as we have seen here. Here in the illustration, you can say as if it is like this, very simple. But actually, not, and even here, this is one tree, we can say, yes, it just might be tortuous, but are prized in a simple way. But actually, it is not in the simple, a simple way. It is really a pattern of complex, like that, you see? And tortuous, vary in size, and intertwines, just as branches of the trees, you see? And a single ductal system can extend over a larger area of the breast. If you look from here, can go up to here. And what the significance of that? What do you think the significance the spread of Spread of humors. Excellent. Uh, Excellent. Well done. So, segmental malignant infiltrate can extend over larger area, over large region, not appear like a segmental. Sometimes we have seen DCIS or something regional calcifications, not really segmental one. Okay? And even a segment may cross into multiple quadrants not one quadrant. And it is not just, it is simple like this, okay? It is really a complex process and we are not going to, uh, to dig deep in these things because it is so confusing and will take long times. Okay, if we look here, look for this ductogram and arborization of the ductile. It is, it is like a segment, taking a segment. But look for this. Usually in ductography, we inject contrast in single orifice, okay? And that going into a single ductal system. So looking for this example and how is taking this a segment, look for the other one, this one, taking larger area and look for this one and fibrocystic, okay? Here, and opacification, even multiple connecting cysts. These are in large terminal duct lobular unit. And look for these illustrations. If we will follow it, you imagine we have just to see 
when all the suffice duct, this one we expect to see it here, or this duct to be seen here. But ossification of this duct taking more than half of the breast. If you divide here from the nipple, taking a line, posterior nipple line, look for this quadrant and even extending into the other quadrants. So very important to understand this anatomy and to imagine why or it can explain for us why we could see uh, extension of the disease here or there. Going back to the gross anatomy. Before starting the gross anatomy, do you have any question regarding the microscopic anatomy? Mm -hmm. No question. What, what, uh, what uh, the content of the lobule? What, what? The component of the lobule. A lobule. It's okay. Go back to lobule. Again, no problem. Fatima. Okay, we can, the, this, this is segmental duct and these are multiple duct lobular unit. Here, outside the lobule, this is representing cancer extension, but outside here, this is what? This is extra lobular uh, terminal duct. And inside, it is intralobular, terminal ducts, okay? And the cancer can arise here and extending inside or extending outside like here in this illustration. And this is segmental duct. Uh, with this orientation, we can say this is an anterior lobule and we can say this is a posterior lobule. And usually the anterior terminal duct lobular unit are larger than the posterior terminal duct lobular unit. And at the end here, this is, we call it terminal duct lobular unit. And this is outside the lobule, is the extralobular terminal duct. And this is the lobule, you see, we can see it here. Let us go back for another illustration that you can. Okay, that one here. This is the main duct, Fatima. That is the main duct. Okay? Okay. Going, going into segmental, subsegmental until it terminates. This is the end of the duct, the terminal duct. Alas, this terminal duct has two portions. One portion outside the lobule. We call it extra lobular terminal duct. And what is inside, we call it intralobular terminal duct. You got it. This mm -hmm. is extra lobular terminal duct, and this is continuation. So immediately continuation inside is intralobular duct, uh, terminal duct, and the cellular unit, the cells, line, it will extend like that throughout and even extend into the SNI. The end of the duct, blind end of the duct, like in the lung, you see, it ends into alveoli. The bronchi, bronchioles, then end into the alveoli. Here it is the same. It ends into these, they call it ductules or alveoli. Okay, ductules or alveoli, the same, same as in the lung. Blind-ended tubules or ductules, okay? These mm -hmm. ductules even surrounded, con interconnecting together by a special type of loose connective tissue, stroma rich in capillaries. Same as in the lung, it is rich in capillaries. This and the connective tissue connecting it 
it is a special type of connective tissue, as we mentioned. And together, the, these ductures and the intralopular ducts, as well as the surrounding interconnecting loose connective tissue, together we call it lobule. I just EAD, they call it a lobule. Okay? And this lobule, along with the extra lobular terminal duct, together, collectively, they call it a terminal duct lobular unit. Where is that, Sinai? This, this alveolar. Alveo these alveoli and the smallest, yani usually, a Sinai are smaller than alveoli. Mm. See, the component of these alveoli, they call it a Sinai. Like yes. this. You yeah, see, both. these are the ductures. You see, these, these are the ductures. Okay? These ductures, as you have seen here, the gray area is the loose connective tissue stroma. Connecting these ductures or alveoli, okay? Mm -hmm. And these intralopular ducts, okay? This is our intralopular ducts. And these intralopular ducts, along with these ductures or alveoli and surrounding stroma together, we call it what? Lobule. 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 Okay. Lobule connecting my main duct by extralobular terminal duct. This is the end of the duct. That and from here, that is the end of the duct, part of which outside the lobule, and part of which inside the lobule. Together, the extralobular terminal duct, the terminal duct, including the lobule, they call it terminal duct lobular unit, as a unit, both representing a unit called terminal duct lobular unit. And because this is where the proliferation it is a proliferative area and affecting by hormone, influenced by hormones. You see, due to any mm -hmm. yani, rapid proliferation and extensive proliferation, that is why they found that the cancer or main pathology arise, uh, even the fibrocystic is a proliferative process, okay? It's arises in the terminal duct lobular unit. And a lot of uh, yani pathology arise in terminal duct lobular unit. And fibroadenoma, it is, it is part of which is fibroepithelial. It is a fibroepithelial. There is a stroma here in the terminal duct lobular unit. At the level of lobule, there is a stroma. So uh, arising from the stroma and the epithelial of terminal duct lobular unit. And the fibrocystic itself affecting both the stroma because it is a fibrocystic, okay? Yani part of which is a spectrum affecting the epithelium, affecting the stroma, resulting in cystic changes, resulting in fibrosis, resulting in epitheliosis and adenosis. All the components occur within this fibrous, uh, within this terminal duct lobular unit. And the cancer itself, either the cancer arising into the ducts of this unit or arising from the asini. When arising from the asini, they call it lobular cancer. Or what? An abbreviation. Asiner. And when arising from the duct, the ducts of the asina itself, they call it DAB. DABs. DABs. That this is the new. Yes. AABs when arising from the asini, specifically the asini. Okay, from these ductures. When arising from these ductures, okay, within the lobule, terminal duct lobular unit, or from the lobule, then they call it AABs. When arising from the ducts, 
they call it DABs. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, any more question or shall we go to the next section? Mm -hmm. Okay, no more questions. You know that the, rip, the, the breast is extending from the second to the seventh rib in majority of females. Okay, it is resting into the pectoralis major or chest wall. And the key anatomical structures, skin, okay, fat, uh, facial layers, cover ligaments, fibroglandular tissue, lymphatics, neurovascular structures. So we'll go through these structures one by one. Huh. Any abnormality in this mammogram or it is a normal one? So here, where are you today? This is for you. Assalamu alaikum. It is special uh, for you. Yes, this is a part of a normal variant representing posterior epidemic uh, hypergenic. Well defined lesion, like well, representing external is muscle. Excellent, well done. That is why I gave it gift for you. I know you know it. Yes. What we have seen here, okay, but we have to make sure. Yeah, we cannot say directly, as especially in this case, it can be part yes. of a. It can be. We have to make sure to do ultrasound or MRI or to compare with CT, if is a patient having a CT, to make sure if this is a normal variant or not. But here, it is relatively yani, more clear because it simulates the muscles. But in this case, definitely, I'll not be confident to say this is an externalis muscle. And if it is bilateral and straightforward triangular structures with striations and uh, intramuscular small fats, it will be clear, straightforward to say this is sternalis muscle, which is anatomic variant, as you said. In, uh, it is uncommon, seen only in 5% etiology and certain. It is just seen on the medial breast. Important to see it, medial breast, and sometimes can be mistaken for pathology. But as we said, we should not in the first case here, it can be a mass. This is here, it can be mass. I cannot confidently here say, but I, I have to put it in the differential diagnosis and clarify to make sure this is not just an externalis muscle. But in the second and these cases, definitely this is straightforward. It is medial, parasternal, okay? And uh, it is inferior medial aspect of the sternum. And it is medial to, it is medial to the medial edge of pectoralis. You see, this is a pectoralis. It is medial to the, pectoral, to the edge of the pectoralis muscles, okay? Starting from outside, from the skin. As you have seen first, you said the skin was thick in that case. Oh, the skin is thick in that case. Why we said the skin is thickened? On what base? When we say there is a skin thickening, either we compare it with the remain of the press, there is asymmetric thickening or compared with contralateral press, there is asymmetric thickening, or the skin is more than two millimeters. 
If it is more than two millimeter, then we can say the skin is thickened. And not like on ultrasound, we can see different layers of the skin. Here on mammography, we can see skin at very thin opaque lines, okay? Or soft tissue density, linear density. Lining the breast from outside. It can be slightly thick in younger patients or in the inferior portion of the breast, but it should not still be yani, very thick or pathological thickening. Okay. Definitely here we can say this is thickening. Though the skin here is really normal, but look the areolar skin here and inferior breast is definitely thick. Compare it with the remain of the breast or with the contralateral breast. And this is definitely pathology. And regarding the nipple areolar complex, Montgomery gland. The Montgomery gland, part of the skin, okay? Usually we have seen it on ultrasound, but on mammography, we could not appreciate it. We could not see it. Unless it gets complicated and associated with abscess formation or whatever. And what are the caves of Copans? These caves of Copans are normal variants. If you look here, you can see tiny lucency uniformly scattered throughout the skin. Here it is seen as end on. These, uh, these tiny, tiny two to three millimeter radiolucencies here seen as end on and representing what? What does it represent? Actually are if you can see here are seen in continuation with subcutaneous fat. So invagination, regular invagination of subcutaneous fat into the dermis represent these tiny lucencies. You see here magnification. You can see it in a specimen and you can see it here. This they call it caves of copans, which are normal, normal variants. Okay, what we can see here, what is the difference between these two images? This image and this image. Is it the same? And this? Huh? Are they the same? Sarah Osman. Yes. What is the difference between this mammogram and this one? This is the same patient. The same woman, I mean. Mm -hmm. Might not be a patient, but same woman. What is the difference between this image and this image? Go to the first lecture. In Did the you have the left side is the medilateral oblique. On the right side, extended lateral view. Now, both are MLO. MLO. And these both are CC. Different. These are different from this. Huh? What is going on here? This CC view and this is MLO view. Might be the same patient, but representing something different. And why this image look like this? Huh? There is no difference between these two images, yeah, so here? Well, like what the human on the right, this is the homosynthesis, lacking. Yes, but it is 2D. But it's 2D. 2D, the homosynthesis, we call it what? 
that the 2D of tomosynthesis, they call it what? You forget the first lecture. Yeah? Sense size mammography. You remember? Sense size mammography. Do you remember it? When they reconstruct the tomosensis into 2D, they call it the sensitized mammography. We said to reduce so as not to do acquired mammography and acquired tomosensis. They are doing only 3D mammography and reconstruct it into 2D, doing a sensitized, yani sensitized or sensitized. Yani they make it from the 3D is not an acquired one. Musanna is not an acquired tomosensis. It's not an acquired 2D. It's sensized 2D. So because it's sensized from 3D, some artifacts are, yani some artifacts related to the skin occur in this type of mammography. If you compare this, you can see the skin here, but here the skin vanished, disappeared. Yes, that is why loss of skin resolution, they call it skin burnout artifact in sensitized image, skin burnout. If you look here, this is the same. This is hard 2 d The skin is not thickened. There is nothing in subcutaneous. But there is band of added density parallel the skin in the subcutaneous fat. This bright band artifact, okay, in sensitized uh, image 2D. And here there is burnout in this portion, as if the skin is cut. It's not clear. The resolution, you can see skin here, you can see skin here. But in this portion, you could not see skin. So there is a skin burnout, and here, you can see this type of artifact as well. And this, they call it a slinky shadowing clips artifact. As if you see the patient having, or the patient with this uh, clips causing these types of artifacts. Okay, let us go for nipple areolar complex. We described before, we said, the formation of the nipples before in the embryology from the uh, what we call it what from the ectoderm, a version of the ectodermal uh, layer i what the bit yes okay the bit the, the mammary bit or what then uh, at the orifice of the ducts then get everted due to proliferation of underlying byzantines and we said it form of duct smooth muscles, fibrous component, blood vessels, abundant in lymphatics, what is called subareolar or sabis plexus, but devoid of fat. These mm -hmm. are really important. And the ductal system, okay, open through orifices in the nipple. And these orifices, they said in more than 90%, about five to nine orifices. Okay. And the ducts at the periphery going gradually and at the center extending straight to the chest wall, okay? And benign development variation we discussed already, inversion, retraction, and all these congenital problems. And we mentioned that because the uh, epithelial cells of the duct seen in continuation with the nipple the skin, that is why can explain the extension of the cancer from the through the this epithelial from the duct into the nipple area and one of the theories of budget and the nipple it should be like this inverted smooth there are variation in size but at least we have to compare it with the contralateral one and with the pictures density and all these things this classification definitely is abnormal.
nipple should, is not a normal variant or should be classified. Classification is abnormal. It could be benign or malignant conditions. We have to clarify it and to make sure what is the cause of that. Okay. In the development of the breast, okay? The breast, we said it is the skin. And as you know, there is a superficial layer of fascia. And this is superficial layer of fascia. It has two layers. One layer posterior at the pectoral and one layer just parallel to the skin. And there are two theories. One theory that this superficial layer is split and then the breast develop within or they, they said this is an insinuations or the other theory is invaginations. The ductal system invaginate and then enveloped by this superficial fascia, okay, uh, incompletely because there is lack of fascia here in the, at the nipple areolar complex. And if you look for these illustrations, you can see the breast here. The fascia is devoid at the nipple areolar complex, starting from the edge of the nipple areolar complex. This is a superficial layer of the superficial fascia, okay? And here, this is the deeper, the deep layer of the superficial fascia. And there is another fascia here. Uh, we'll see it later. There are deep fascia and there is superficial fascia. Okay, so the anterior, this is the anterior superficial fascia. And if you look here, this is the this is the anterior, this is a superficial fascia. Here, this is a superficial fascia. But here, the superficial fascia is usually very close to the skin, not encasing the press parenchyma. What encasing the press parenchyma is part of the deep fascia. And the anterior one, they call it the anterior mammary fascia. And the posterior one is called it deep fascia layer or retro mammary fascia. Is it clear? Here, close to the gland is the anterior. The superficial fascia is here. From the anterior, from the anterior fascia, these are cobra ligament going to the superficial layer of superficial fascia. This is a superficial fascia. It is more appreciable on ultrasound rather than on mammography. You got it? No one answer. Is it clear or not clear? Yes, it is clear. Clear for me, it's unclear, doctor. Okay, we have superficial fascia and we have a deep fascia. The superficial fascia parallels the skin. Okay, and the deep fascia is close to the gland. This is the deep fascia. This is the anterior mammary okay. fascia. This is the anterior mammary okay. fascia. And this is the deep fascia, retro mammary fascia. These both are a deep fascia. The anterior, okay. the posterior, retro mammary, these are deep fascia. The superficial okay. fascia is a little bit away from the gland. It is close to the skin here. You can see line going here. Can mm -hmm. you see this? Yes. Can you yes. see the opaque line? Sometimes more yes. close to the skin and in some areas a little bit away from the skin. Yeah. This is a superficial fascia. Yeah. And the copper ligament, yeah. you will see it going through the gland. And you will see here from the anterior one going into the deep fascia and coming back. We'll see it more. Okay. Okay. So, what okay. are the stomach? Would you please close your mic? Yeah, Dr. Rabad. Yes. Uh, superficial patient still in the, uh, still in the uh, 
البوستيرير اليمنت حقها صح؟ اوفر لاين البيكتوراليس يا ات از ات از كلوز تو ذا بيكتوراليس مثلا اوكي يعني ذا بوستيرير ون از كلوز تو ذا بيكتوراليس اكسكيوز مي Would you please close the mic? Okay, can you see it here? Superficial layer. They said it's split, it's split and envelop the breast. Or invaginate and enclosing the breast. One behind and one anterior. Okay, but there is there is superficial and there is a deep facial layer. The deep facial is retromama is anterior mammary fascia and retromammary mammary fascia. Okay, right. Yes. Okay. Uh, if we look for this illustration, we can see here, this is a glandular part in green, and this is a stromal part, the connective tissue stroma or fibrous stroma, the orange, Halas representing the cooper ligament traversing from the skin to the back, to the deep fascia, to the pectoral, to the deep portion, I mean, to the pectoral fascia. Okay, this all throughout, it is the infrastructure of the breast. It is holding the breast. It is of varying amount between individuals. It is not same amount. These are sh uh, uh, sheets of compact stroma, connective tissue stroma. Okay, we call it the Cooper ligaments are dense, compact, as we mentioned. Appear opaque on mammography, soft tissue opaque. Unlike that loose intraductal, intra, intralopular or periductal loose connective tissue stroma. As we mentioned, extend from the chest wall to the nipple and skin or the reverse from the skin going and support the breast to the chest wall. It secure the breast. And there is main bulk of the mammary gland is about is what? The main bulk is fat. Okay. And interspersed between these stroma and in the anterior to the gland, we call it pre-mammary and uh, posterior to retromammary. This is also fat and it has to be black, okay? As we described before. So when this Cooper ligament thickened, the fat become opaque, to say increase breast density, look, you have to see the fat areas of the fat is loosened. When we lose the loosency of the fat, then this breast, there is diffuse or global increased density along with thickening of the cooper ligament. And skin thickening, that means this is global breast edema. Mm -hmm. Sometimes there are variations in the edema. Here, this is more global. Here, yes, it is global, but asymmetric. There is more edema around the lesions than in the remain of the, of the breast. Asymmetric the edema. So here more opaque than the remain. And the copper ligament more thick than here. And the skin, areolar skin and inferior portion of the breast is more thick than the remain of the breast. And again, in this case, yes, this is the lesions but there is increased density. Uh, there is lack of lucency of the fat in the surrounding to the mass. So this is very lesion edema. This is very lesion edema. 
If we look here, there is no edema. The edema here is more focalized. There is thickening of the Cooper ligament adjacent to the lesions. So we have distortions and very lesion edema extending in a segmental way to the nipple areolar complex. And this illustrates, uh, illustration demonstrate again, this is the lobes or this is a gland, okay? And in between the lobes, what is that traversing from the nipple or the skin to the chest wall? Representing what? These structures? Cooper ligaments. Cooper. These are the Cooper ligaments supporting the breast. Okay, so when get infiltrated by the tumor, it becomes thickened and shortened as we have seen in this case, thick and shortened. And because are attached to the skin, what will happen? It results what in this- In the orange. The BD orange. Okay, the, BD, the cause of this BD orange, these are the site of attachment of the Cooper ligament are shortened and pulling the skin in. So giving that appearance. Again, here we can see these in these illustrations, these are Cooper ligaments going like that. So these look for the Cooper ligament. This is the anterior, the envelope, this is anterior mammary fascia. Okay, this is the anterior mammary fascia. Invaginating here and coming back, okay, causing or forming the Cooper ligament attached to superficial layer of superficial fascia. Okay, you have seen it. And these are Cooper ligaments. Here, it seems to be just more fibrotic in, in volume breast, but are not thickening, not distorting. These are relatively normal Cooper ligament attached to underlying fascia but we can compare it here. Can you see the Cooper ligaments here? Thick, and there is adjacent distortion in the anterior mammary line or in the contour of the anterior fat glandular interface. Again, this case, there is some distortion in the Cooper ligament or in the anterior layer, more obvious in this image on this mammography. And on MRI, it's seen as abnormal enhancement in a case of malignancy. Okay, sorry, this regarding the stroma, fibrofatty stroma, normal, and uh, uh, some examples of abnormality. What about this? What is wrong in this mammography? Is it normal or abnormal? Ferris of all. And what does that arrow represent? Represent what? Represent the normal structure or an abnormal structure? Calcification within a duct. Calcification in a duct. Suggestion. What else? Mm -hmm. Um, it shows a skin thickening and uh, a thickened a Cooper ligament somehow uh, calcified. Mm -hmm. Okay, what is this? Uh, architectural uh, or, or yani... But I'm just asking about this structure. What is this structure? It's coming from the nipple, like in my, yani it's not going uh, inside the... Excellent, Nauras. Excellent, well done. Yes. Ha. Huh. Is it like, um, uh, no, uh -huh. developmental anomaly, yani, or la? La, no, it shouldn't be here. Mm -hmm. Describe what you have seen. A tubular, tubular structure. Tubular, tubular soft tissue structures. 
Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Extending from the uh, nipple. Uh, yeah, it is not ending the... here. It is coiled only. Coiled it, on is it. it is going. Okay, but here it seemed to be just larger and might be going like that. More superficial. It is like it is like this structure. Mm -hmm. Huh? I'm trying Blood to have vessel. Blood vessel. It's a vessel. Yes, that is a vessel. Okay. Yeah, and being so superficial, what do you think? Most likely. Vein. Some both vein. It's a vein. Vein. Man. vein. Most probably vein. Mm -hmm. We are not familiar. Yani, we are not usually looking for vessel abnormality on mammogram. Generally, we are looking on vascular structure or vascular abnormality on ultrasound. But this is a vascular structure. Okay? I agree with you if you said, yes, going into the nipple, it might be a duct as a differential diagnosis. But not usually, the duct is parallel, is going parallel to the skin and coil like this and ending like this. Yes, and not so even, and, and it is anterior to the glandular structure. Mm -hmm. it, this is the anterior to fat glandular interface. Very unlikely to have a duct in the subcutaneous region. Yes. By locations, by locations, it seems to be, is it a normal vessel? Is an enlarged vessel? Yes. Most probably this is an enlarged vessel. That is it. What we can see, we'll go for ultrasound to clarify and to do to put doubler and to make sure what is that of structures. Okay, and what about this? Hmm. Uh, same thing, it's a, um, a tubular tortuous uh, structure like uh... so. Most likely, this, like, yes, most likely it's like this, like elephant, yes, it's even. Mm -hmm. It is like, like what we have seen in the limbs, lower limbs, large mm -hmm. dilated For vascular sure. structures within the breast. What we can say more than this, that is large dilated, tortuous vascular structures within the breast. So, wonder, wonder disease. It, what? Monder, this, it can be Monder, this one. But this is most likely not Monder disease. This is more than that. Um, usually we are doing color Doppler to go to see the breast. But the breast like other organs having uh, blood, supply and it is blood supply as you know more appreciated on MRI than on mammography or on ultrasound to lesser extent to lesser extent than MRI. But on mammography here we can see vascular structures superimpose each others like superimposition of other tissue. Just we could appreciate it as uh, uniform or branching linear densities that is it but on mri we could appreciate the medial part from internal thoracic and the lateral thoracic artery branch of the axillary and as you know the thoracoacromial and intercostal arteries also supplying the lateral portion of the breast and on as we mentioned on mammography just we'll see linear densities like this. Here we can say these are in large vessels. And here we can say these are calcified, heavily calcified vessels. Not more than that. Not like on ultrasound or on MRI. The venous drainage for us, you know that the importance of which is in the spread of cancer, like lymphatic, uh, vessels and we have two systems for the breast 
superficial and deep system. The superficial lie within, before talking about superficial, the deep system is straightforward, is a bared system, is a following the arterial system. This is a deep system. You see, bared. Whenever you have an artery branch, you have a venous uh, vessels. This is a deep one. But the superficial one is unbared. Okay? It's just a vein. And usually seen so superficial. Okay? Just underneath the skin. And these are the responsible of wonder disease, thrombophlebitis. And usually the superficial blood getting into the deep system from the superficial going into the deep system and from the facial, okay? The venous supply drain centrally then go to the deep system and they mention that it provides some connection between the two press right and left press. And this is really important. I think we have a lot of connections in our Sudanese female, and this is most likely can explain the theory of cross midline. Okay, the, a lot of cross midline seen in Sudanese ladies. I think this connection plays important role uh, in this theory. And these surface veins sometimes might enlarge due to central obstruction like superior vena cava syndrome, chronic venous thrombosis of clavian. Where is the draining? The draining system, if it is obstructing, okay, or arteriovenous, something like in chronic renal uh, problem and these things, okay? What is going on in this case? Mm -hmm. I suggest that you are going like I this. Yes. So just we said here, this can be enlarged in case of central obstructions. So this is an example. Look for the vessels. These are venous because they are so superficial and expected even deep to be engorged, to be enlarged because from superficial, it goes back into uh, into the deeper system. So we have bilateral breast swelling and venous congestion due to central venous occlusion. This is an example of central venous occlusion. It is a straightforward. It is both bilateral breast, okay, and superficial vessels. Look for the vessels. You can trace it just at their knees to the skin. Both sides, but being that deep vessels are also in large expected, but because the superficial are in large, that means this is the venous system. So uh, there is also uh, a plexus, important venous plexus called paston plexus. This paston plexus, important why? It is a valveless vein connecting what the thoracic vein the deep pelvic vein to the internal vertebral venous plexus. So definitely it's going to, to, to get to do what? It's responsible. For metastasis too. Metastasis. metastasis, yes. It will be the root, the root for metastasis, transportation of metastasis and infection to the spine, to the brain, and to the skull and pelvic bone. That is why there is connections between the breast and the pelvis through this paston plexus. And like any other organs, the breast have a nerve supply and it is from intercostal nerves responsible for sensory and automatic, uh, autonomic nerve fibers, but are not controlling the secretion of the milk. It is only related to hormones control. It's not related to nerve supply control. Lymphatic system, which is 
the most important. Why it is important? Why lymphatic system of the person is important? It has what an important you... role in the spread of the uh, tumors. Mm -hmm. oh, excellent. Okay. What else? Huh? Why it is important? And the edema in uh, and uh, drainage of uh, extra or excess fluid in case of uh, uh -huh. uh, mm -hmm. inf inflammatory conditions and so on. Okay. Okay. Any other suggestion? You are right. Why lymphatic system is important? Why we have to understand so, the lymphatic drainage of the breast? Many methods. Uh, Excellent. Excellent. Yes, you are right. You are right. So, understanding of lymphatic great importance because lymphatic drainage has diagnostic and therapeutic implications of breast cancer. And the main prognostic factors, it is independent of size, and for prediction of overall survival and prognostic free survival. And the lymph node involvement indicate that the tumor has achieved a metastatic capability. They said not all breast cancer uh, have the capability to spread into the body. But whenever you have seen lymph node involvement, it means that this breast cancer achieved a metastatic capability and considered as a systemic rather than local disease. And the assessment of nodal disease guide multidisciplinary treatment decision. Okay, and is now considered to be critical role in axillary imaging and modified the treatments or the modification of treatment is based on analysis of lymph node involvement. Okay, but this usually through what? Ultrasound, uh, uh, MRI or ultrasound guided biopsy. But though the fulfilled digital mammography and tomosensis are ferrous modality for local staging of the breast cancer, the visualization of auxiliary lymph node is seen in only 50% of patients, okay? And visualization really limited on mammography. It only demonstrate the lowest part of uh, lymph node groups, or mainly level one. And why these are important? If you look here, we can see what we have seen here. These are all at level one. And yani, with special views, you can see part of level two, but you cannot see definitely high group level three and so forth. And even sometimes level one, as in this case, you see here, you cannot even see the level one. Why these are important? Because we have what is called skip metastasis, seen in 5%. Sometimes cancer, yeah, usually the, the cancer, it has to go from the breast to level one, then level two, then level three. But in 5%, it might go directly to level two or intervectoral or, or to rarely to level three, escaping level when, and in this case, if we could not see it by imaging, uh, it, it will result in uh, bad management. And as you know, regarding the lymphatic drainage and for prognostic and staging purposes, they divide the group, the auxiliary lymph node into three groups. Previously, they mentioned uh, five groups at level one, anterior, posterior, lateral, and um, then central, then apical. But now they make it a little bit simple 
all the, th the anterior, posterior, and lateral, they group it, they are, they are seen below and lateral to the pectoralis minor muscles, and they consider it as level one lymph node group. And posterior to the pectoralis ma minor, as you have seen here in cross sections, posterior to the pectoralis minor, they call it level two. And at level three, it seems superior and medial to the pectoralis minor, up to the clavicles, you see? And if it is seen uh, between the pectoralis minor and major, they consider it as a special group, they call it a rotors node. And as a radiologist, usually these groups, we could not see it on mammography. What we have seen, if you look here, this is the pectoralis minor. What we have seen is below the pectoralis minor, which are only level one or part of level one. We could not see by mammography more than this uh, lymph nodes. And even in your practice, what you have seen in mammography are very limited. Go to ultrasound, you could see even suspicious lymph node, you could not see it or appreciate it on mammography. And as we have seen here, this is obviously thin cortex, abundant fatty hilum, bilateral, uh, level one, axillary, normal axillary lymph node. This is the pectoralis minor, so expect it to be this is the pectoralis minor. So these are below the pectoralis minor. So these are level one. Again, here projecting over the pectoralis major muscles and pectoralis minor are high up. So these are level one, but definitely here are obviously abnormal lymph node. Okay, why abnormal are dense, lacking of fatty hilum. And whenever you have seen an abnormal lymph node, there is 40% chance to find the higher level abnormal lymph node. So here mammography limit us. We could not go further hmm, looking for uh, more, more uh, uh, involvement of lymph node. That is why they depend on ultrasound and MRI on lymph node involvement or mapping. Okay, so in that one, it was so clear. The lymph node is abnormal because lacking the fatty hilum and dense and so forth. Here, this is obviously large, but it is normal lymph node because there is thin cortex and abundant fatty hilum. And this is abnormal, irregular shape and dense, lacking fatty hilum. This is even some fatty hilum there, but cortex definitely thick and associated with micro calcification, and there is some edema and indistinct margins. But in this case, can I ask you, is, the, is there any abnormal lymph node or we consider it as a normal one? Shall we consider it a normal or abnormal in this case? Hmm? To me, the, uh, the left uh, breast uh, lymph nodes are enlarged and uh, somehow dense. I will consider it abnormal. In the right breast, they are small. Because, size, in but... because it is enlarged, we consider it abnormal. This is more, this is dense. larger. Enlarged this is dense. larger than this. Enlarged and dense. I'm talking about the left breast. Mm -hmm. Fatty hyalum. Okay, this is abundant fatty hyalum. Uh, this is this is a, a one a one lymph node. This is one lymph node. Okay, then this is a fatty hyalum indeed. Yeah. Uh huh. So you'll consider it normal. Yeah. You are not happy. I'm not I know happy. that I know that Nauros, you are not happy. 
I am not fit to be honest. Focal, like, cortical thickening. Yes, excellent. I'm like you. This, focal, cortical this thickening. Normal. This is my, my patients. This case, my patients. And from this, from this mammography, I report this as a suspicious lymph node. You see? Mm -hmm. the, this is suspicious. Where is, where is the pathology in the breast? Can you see it? It was very subtle, was occult, but that was metastatic lymph node because of this asymmetric dense cortical thickening. I want from you, you believe on this lymph node is dense. Mm -hmm. Tell me it is the density or the dense is the, is the asymmetric cortical thickening. If yeah. you compare yeah. this cortex with these cortex here, definitely Asymmetry. Focal this cortical dense, thickening. I agree with you. This is dense asymmetric cortical thickening, and that was a metastatic lymph node, and the cancer is here. Mm -hmm. That was the cancer. Very subtle. Okay. So just when, if, yani, if not very clear like this pathological lymph node, we have to compare same level lymph nodes, same axillary lymph nodes, if one lymph node is disproportionately large or dense or demonstrate any subtle finding compared to the remaining of the group or compared to the contralateral, then it will be alarming signs mm -hmm. and we have to consider it and we ev should evaluate the, the, the lymph node by ultrasound. The and, thing, uh, your boss, if you can bring the other slide, the last one. Uh -huh. uh, the thing that confused me in this case that I thought and or I considered, uh, you know, this is not a single lymph node. Uh, this one lymph node and this and another. Yeah, another one, two lymph nodes. That's why I... Uh... But even, even mm -hmm. if you consider this lymph node, there mm -hmm. is a symmetric cortical. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. If you this consider part you know, only... And there is hilum here. This we consider it as focal. asymmetric focal. and uh, yeah, focal cortical thickening, and it is dense compared yes. to, to the cortex in the other uh, breast. Yes. Okay. So uh -huh, looking here, what does it mean? This illustrations. This is illustration for the breast. Yes. And these are lobules. Lobules. Okay, mm -hmm. and the lymph originate into the lobules through intramammary lymph node and intramammary lymph channels. It will, from the deeper portion of the breast going into the skin, then into superiolar or sabis plexus. And from the sabis plexus, then it will go to the axilla. So what do what is the clinical significance of that? Going from the deep into the skin and superiolar. Then going into the axilla. Clinical significance. Uh, retroalveolar masses can spread early to the lymph nodes. Excellent, well done. Even superficial, any retroareolar and superficial lesion, because from the skin directly, the superficial portion directly to the superiolar, and from superiolar directly to the axilla. But if you have any borderline lymph node and you have a superficial lesion, okay, or superiolar region, then you have to put a needle and evaluate that or examine the lymph node pathologically to make sure it is not, uh, because the, it, it is a predictive location. And as you have seen here, this is, you see this area, subtle distortion, MRI demonstrate small, very small cancer, compare it with the lymph node in, this is the same lymph node. On mammography here, yeah. uh, here it's it is an occult cancer, not could not be appreciated on mammography. 
But look, compare the lymph node, size of lymph node to the size of the cancer itself. Yes. Because it is in a retroareolar locations. We consider these are predictive locations. Even if uh, close to the superficial layer of superficial fascia, okay, the lesions. So from superficial fascia, the, it is very rich in lymphatic going directly into the sabis plexus. So as we mentioned, conventionally, the lymphatic plexus going parallel, parallel to, the, to the venous tributaries and going into the axilla starting from level one to level two to level three. This is the conventional stepwise. But you see, with exception of few percentage that it can skip. And then ultimately terminate into thoracic duct the left, on the left side, then to the left subclavian, or directly to the right subclavian on the right side. What is the clinical significance of interconnections of lymphatic pathway? If you look here, you can see look for these lymphatic channels. Yes, here going from, from deep to superior, from superior going to the axilla. But if you look here, you can see some interconnection. What is the significance of these few interconnections? The spread of the disease between uh, two breasts, from one breast to the contralateral one. Okay, one issue. But before that, so yeah, they have to do, when they are doing, they are mm -hmm. doing what? If you have done examination and you could not see uh, clinically uh, abnormal lymph node, pathological lymph node. Clinically, it means by physical examination, by ultrasound or by imaging you could not appreciate any pathological lymph node. So they have to do what? To make MRI. sure that... Huh? MRI. There is nothing on MRI. So the, 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 the surgeon will go for... Beti scan. Yes, to do what? Not beti scan. What? They are not doing, we have no PET scan in Sudan. They are doing what? Before going, before doing surgery, they are doing what? Uh, they inject, I think. Uh... Are you what? Yes, you are right. Inject, uh -huh. inject dye or, uh -huh. or inject. Uh -huh. Even. Mm-hmm. Ink yes. yes, blue ink. Uh -huh. So we call it what? What do you call that? To see what? To see what? To see the drainage yani, within the lymph node. Lymph to see the sentinel uh, node. Which one? Which one? This, the sentinel node. Excellent. Sentinel lymph node. What is sentinel lymph node? Yeah, and the first note that uh, the drains uh, are affected the cancer. Yes. So sentinel node may be located outside the axilla. That, this is the clinical significance. I ask the interconnections because there is some interconnections. So though it is rare, but it can occur. As we mentioned there, we said there is a skip metastasis seen in up to 5% of patients, the, the, the passage, it will not be direct to the ferris, to the level one, then level two, then going, uh, yani, yani going stepwise pattern, in a stepwise pattern from level one, level two, level three to supra club like that. No, it is skip that level due to this interconnection, it might go to the other way might go to level three or supraclav directly, or going to internal mammary, or going to abdominal lymph nodes, or going to contralateral, okay? So then in this case, 
they have to put in their mind that this patient might, the sentinel lymph node might be outside the axilla. And it is the first lymph node drain the breast, okay? It can be one or two lymph nodes, yeah, and not necessarily a single lymph nodes. And usually when they give a dye or a radio uh, isotope and then examine that lymph node and they found the dye or found this, the uh, isotope reach that lymph node, they remove it and examine it for prediction of the metastasis, okay? And they said that the DNA observed is in the supraclav, in infraclav, inter, uh, interpectoral lymph node, it might go directly to, through the pectoralis muscle into the interpectoral lymph node uh, by passing the first group or the level one group of lymph nodes, okay? Or to the internal memory or intramammary lymph node, they said. And as you know, the, in, the lymph node of interest are axillary, intramammary lymph node, axillary node, rotors node in, in the axilla, and supraclav, the external or internal mammary lymph node, erythromammary lymph node, and the alternative routes. When, that, when the main routes blocked, the lymph might shift it to the opposite breast or to the cervical lymph node, to diaphragmatic or to rectal sheath node into peritoneal cavity. Okay. In the gross anatomy, also we have to consider the zonal anatomy. And as you know, the breast, uh, there are three zones in relation to the breast. We have the mammary zone where the fibroglandular parenchyma present. It might be small, it might be large. Anterior to which there is fat, and posterior to which there is fat. Pre-mammary or subcutaneous, and pre mammary or pre-pectoral, okay? In the pre-pectoral region. And these zones are important. As you know, the mammary zones is really where most of the pathology present. And it depends on the amount and size of the fibroglandular parenchyma. Retromammary zone is also important. Fat and connective tissue, a thin layer, but it is a potential space used for reconstructive plastic surgery and imported for plastic surgeons. And so also called Chassian's Persa. Okay, it has this another name. And we'll see is one of the hidden areas for the breast cancer. Here, this is the mammary zones. This is the retromammary zone or Chassian's Persa. And this is the subcutaneous, okay? Uh, look here, this is our patients in the retromammary at the back of the breast. If, if this, the apex of the vectoral is not involved in this image, this is my beak at the small breast at the, at the end of the breast. You can see it here. It was a, a breast cancer. And in these areas, they call it no man's land. What is a no man's land? This is a retroglandular clear space. This is the same as that area, what we have said, the retromammary clear zone or the retromammary fat. They call it no man's land. And this both in the CC and in the MLO. And this area, this clear area, you see, we have to look for any asymmetry in that area and consider one of the uh, forbidden zones or hidden zone for breast cancer. And if you look here, they draw this line parallel to the pectoralis and two, three to four centimeters, okay? Parallel to the pectoralis muscle, they call it Milky Way. 
this way. They call it the Milky Way. Again, in the Retroma Marie, not like this one. If you look here, this is not parallel to Pectoralis. This is just retro mammary, posterior to the uh, gland. The fat, retro mammary fat. They call it no man's land. But the Milky Way is parallel to the Pectoralis muscles, three to five, four centimeter, also considered to be hidden zone. You have to revise. These are the review areas, hidden areas. We have to revise it again. You see, this is lesions in no man's land. No, in a Milky Way, I mean. This is parallel to the pectoralis. This is a Milky Way. Okay. And again, one of the hidden areas is the medial portion of the breast. Look again and review the medial breast. There is arrow here. And again, in this case, these two cases, inferior breast, one of the hidden area. You see, here you can see the review areas or the hidden areas, retromammary fat, okay, inferior breast, superiolar, apex of the parenchyma, and the axilla. Okay. Uh, can you tell me here what is the hidden area in this case? Any pathology, any cancer in this case? Milk way. Milk way, milk way no. in, milk way you will expect it to see where? Parallel to the pectoralis. Parallel to pectoralis, definitely it will be on MLO. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Milk it way. is uh, no man's the last... fairest one, the fairest one, yeah. No man's. Is... No, man. no, this is not a no man. This is the medial breast. Huh? Medial, medial breast. This is a medial breast. Axilla, sorry, Malish. Axilla. Axilla on CC view. Um, epic, epical zone of the. Uh -huh. This is the MLO. This is the MLO. Or extended. This is seen to be extended view. And these are CC view. Uh -huh. Where is the lesion? You cannot expect it. There are very subtle, very, very, very subtle. Not obvious. You are talking about this, this is trauma very link node. Yeah. <laughs> Pre-mammary area, inferior, uh, the inferior uh -huh. breast. Can you see it now? What is the cancer? Ah, uh, retroreolar. <laughs> retroreolar. You see it? We can see in the... Can no. you see it? Yes, now I can see it. Can you see it? That is yes. the one. That is the one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Look at it here on MRI. This is the same patient on ultrasound and on MRI. So be aware of retroareolar region. Be aware of it. No, it's review, tricky. It again, review it again and again. And look here. Retro this is where. This is where. I put for this you is again the line. Which Make one? No. This consider it. Apical part of the parenchyma. The, epi Iwa, the apex of the parenchyma. This mm. is the apex. Be sure or be aware about the apex of the parenchyma. Compare it with the contralateral. Mm. This is only asymmetry. And it was mm. a cancer. That was a cancer. And here, can you see it here? This is five years prior. Look for the contour concave contour of fat glandular interface. Here, there is a little filling, very subtle after one year. Milch. And this is the follow-up. Look, Milch. it becomes convex. Mm. On a spot, does not spread away, it's still convex. 
though it looks like the same parenchyma, but it is convex. But look here, the area there is fat. Now start to become the area relatively dense and changing mm -hmm. contour. Very subtle. Look at it on ultrasound. You have to be aware about the contour. Okay, the parenchymal contour. Can you see it here? Again, look mm -hmm. for contour. There is very subtle distortion in the contour and asymmetric. This is the same here. You see it? some distortion again at the contour. Here superiorly and here the same lesion is posteriorly. So the press contour is, has to be like this, like this. Any asymmetry or any distortion in the contour, you have to think about it. Look here, this is prior and this is now. Look at this area, there is filling here in the contour and that was a cancer. Huh. Can you see here? Again, some subtle distortion in the contour with asymmetry. There is focal asymmetry. If you compare here this area with this area and here, there is asymmetry, focal asymmetry and distortion in the contour, dense lymph node. Again, here, this is the no man's land or retromammary fat. There is another area of asymmetry and distortion. And here, look, in the median crest, there is comparative, there is asymmetry, and there is diffuse edema and some skin sickening. All are subtle, but multicentric cancer. So zonal anatomy is important. And they found what? They found that 75% in women or premenopausal women having relatively denser breast, they found cancer that in a zone just one centimeter beneath the subcutaneous and retromammary fat. If you draw, if you draw like this, this is a mammary zone like this, okay? So this is retromammary, retro, uh, subcutaneous fat, and this is retromammary fat. Just go for one centimeter. Surrounding the mammary zone, looking for cancer within these portions, you will find something abnormal. Can you see it here at the periphery? And I think, I don't know, I, I found that while we are studying the uh, uh, lobular differentiation in the, during puberty, they have mentioned that the glandular tissue starts in the periphery of the breast getting into the central, from periphery going into the central. So this is the first area where the, the gland is starting and so it will be more glandular, more epithelial in these portions. I think this is can be one of the theories that that is why the, the cancer is more, is found, uh, they found it more in these locations. And also in those young, we found that I will come for it. Let us finish the forbidden areas. So in conclusion, what are the forbidden areas? The no man's land and the Milky Way, as we mentioned, the Milky Way, three to four centimeter parallel to the pectoralis. And no man's land, just retromammary fat. So both represent the same. Be aware about retromammary fat or the posterior crest. Be aware about subareolar region. Be aware about the inferior crest. Be aware about the medial crest. 
Be aware about the epics of the parenchyma and be aware about the axilla. Okay, revise it again and again looking for cancer. And uh -huh. what is your observation in this image? This is heterogeneously dense breast and this is scattered fibroglandular parenchyma, but the parenchyma is more where? In which portion of the breast? And this is also scattered fibroglandular parenchyma. The parenchyma, the residual parenchyma is in, is still in? The huh? Where? If you divide the breast like this, and like this. So, by quadrant, by quadrant, which quadrant? Upper, upper, upper outer. outer. Upper yes, outer. yes, the parenchyma is still in upper outer quadrant. And this is a case of breast cancer. This is a breast cancer. This focal asymmetry representing a breast cancer. So, as you know, the upper outer quadrant contain more fibroglandular tissue and that they consider it the theory why the majority of breast cancer occur in the upper outer quadrant. And as I told you from my observation, uh, the teenager while developing the breast, they are coming with tender, swollen press in the upper outer quadrant, and we find it adenosis. See, usually, usually physiological adenosis, what I have observed is in the upper outer quadrant, almost filling the whole breast with paucity of the uh, retromammary and retro subcutaneous fat apart from the remain of the breast. I think even the development, the starting of the development of the breast, and yani from the beginning, the upper outer quadrant, where the breast start to develop or uh, more development of the parenchyma and when it gets involuted, involute from the remain and because the amount is still much more in the upper outer quadrant, the residual, what we have seen, more in the upper quadrant. That is why Probably the incidence uh, of breast cancer is more in the upper outer quadrant. Do you think that large breast increase incidence of breast cancer? We have seen previously Zagigiantomastia. Do you remember that case? Mm -hmm. Yes. Increase risk yes. for breast cancer? We remember the gargantomastia, and yes, it increases. Uh-huh. Yeah. But I brought this case. I don't think so. Yeah, because this is fatty breast. Fatty, yeah. Fatty, no glandular tissue. Yeah. Whenever, whenever the dense breast or the more glandular breast, there is more... The, the more risk. For those who have... Uh, those who have... Um, uh, what we call it uh, during puberty, we said juvenile hypertrophy. Those who have juvenile hypertrophy, okay, those they have increased risk because that was adenosis, increased gland, increased amount of gland. They suggest that there is increased risk. But gynecomastia in general, gynecomastia, if it is due to increase to uh, to fat, there is no, yani, what is the relation between the fat and the development of breast cancer? They said that it is not clear that large breast means that there is greater number of TDLS. Increase the risk is increase the TDLS, the glandular portion. Agree, yes? Since this location, or the development of breast cancer. The TDLS is the location. Whenever we have more TDLS, more proliferations, we have more cancer. 
If we have more gland, we have more cancer. But since we have no more gland, just due to increase yani, macromastia, yeah, due to increase fat, yani, a large amount of fat, not related to, to, to development of breast cancer. However, I suspect that breast size and true uh, glandularity are independent of one another. And there are no good studies that have demonstrated any significant relationship between size and breast cancer. Okay, so in a summary, adequate understanding of the details, breast anatomy, help to recognize its abnormality and to develop diagnostic skills and enhance ability to interpret imaging. And press imaging primarily involves the assessment of the morphology and macroscopically visible press structures as uh, although different process may produce similar imaging morphological findings, rather than just searching for pattern, the radiologist has to understand the underlying process that produces morphological changes, okay? In various imaging studies, and ideally the interpreter should able to explain why uh, using specific criteria why a finding is judged benign or potentially malignant. We have to tell them. We have to tell the clinician on what base we said this benign or this malignant. And most of the benign breast disease and cancer, as you know, is uh, arising in the ductile terminal duct lobular unit. And basic understanding of complex underlying microscopic structures so is important in which change will take place and then will help us to understand pathological process and image interpretations and the anatomy of the breast and organization and distribution of histologic elements it will shape the imaging findings also understanding the ductal anatomy of the breast provide insights into tumorigenesis, which in turn offer guidance on therapeutic decisions. To go for mastectomy or to go for lumpectomy or to start with or to do that. Thank you very much for attention. And I hope you benefit from this discussion. Really, thank you. Do you have a formal question before uh, close the recording? They might benefit from that discussion. If you have one questions, formal questions, uh, you can ask. Regarding uh, the lecture and yeah, what we have discussed, discussed in the lecture. Mm -hmm. okay. Asma, Asma Muhammad, would you please close your mic? Do you have a question? If no more question, we can close the recording.